Hello, everyone. Uh, Edward is with us today. Thank you for coming to Belgrade, to HIPCON. Nice to have you here. Uh, OK, so tell me something about yourself. Like, um, do you have some Bitcoin to share? Bitcoin? Yeah, I have, actually. <laughs> how come? Uh, how come? Yeah. Or how much? Uh, well, <laughs> it depends on you. <laughs> yeah, I have some. Like, I invest in Bitcoin and some crypto, right? OK, OK, cool. Um, and um, there is one interesting thing about you. You know some fighting thing? Aha, uh -huh. you asked me this before the conference, right? Yeah, I do some fighting from <laughs> my guy, yes, so I'm not oh, only kind of okay. geek. Yeah, okay, yeah. so I can stand a little bit yeah. <laughs> further no, away. No worries. Okay, I'm kidding. Uh, enjoy, <laughs> and, you know, stage is yours. Thank you. Just, yeah, am I connected? Do you hear me, folks? Okay, Serbia, let's make some noise. Whoa! Let's load up some batteries. Come on! That was the lunch. You, you were fed up and... And yeah, I'm tired probably. Let's keep the energy high, okay? So folks, uh, my name is Edward. I'm from Latvia. And you know, when you start working on a presentation, you usually have a goal. You have to ask yourself, what, the message I wa what message I want, uh, you, want, you want to deliver to the audience? And surprise, surprise, today I have no specific goal. No goal at all. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share a story. A story about the project that uh, we have built with my colleague. And I believe that you will find some valuable lessons there. Doesn't sound like a plan. Sounds like a plan? Good, let's move on then. Okay. So, um, have you heard about DevTube? DevTube. Some of you, DevTube. One, two, three. Not bad. <laughs> Information is like a spreading slowly, right? We are not there yet, but soon. So, um, who is using DevTube? Who is like a visiting Dev? That's not bad. Amazing. The funny fact is that we are not advertising this project at all. So, it's kind of naturally spreading over the world. So, which is great. So, to answer a question, what is DevTube? I found a nice tweet. And actually, here's what it is. One person says, it's all developers related YouTube videos minus all the distracting cat videos and YouTube algorithms. <laughs> so it's like a no cats, just technical videos, uh, which is a nice explanation basically because, for example, if you look for a Swift on YouTube, Swift, just type it. What do you get? What do you think? Sorry? Taylor Swift, exactly, the singer. Maybe this is something that you're looking for, but you know, sometimes it's not, right? So this is why we have built DevTube. But it's actually a bit more than just a YouTube on steroids, right? Because uh, it's open source. It's completely open source, and because I believe in open source movement. So you can find the code online, fork it, and build your own DevTube, essentially, which is great. The second uh, thing is that we curate all the channels and videos through the GitHub pull requests, which is good. So for example, if some information is missing there, you just submit the pull request and your channel or your video will get there automatically. Not bad, right? All data is mutable, which means that everyone in our community can just go there and change the data again by submitting the, the PR. The practical example would be like this. Uh, HIPCON organizers, they, mis uh, they misspell your name, mistype your name. So should I write the HIPCON organizers, please fix this description in this YouTube video? No, I can just issue the pull request and community will merge it back. Good, right? Not bad. So all data is mutable. Uh, there are no marketing videos. We cut them all. No marketing at all. And it's also community-driven. If you find some marketing video on some channel, you issue the pull request, and it will immediately get removed from the DevTube. So it's only about technical videos. We also believe that we introduced better ranking algorithm than YouTube. Because uh, I don't know if you agree with me, but when you, for example, look for a video, let's say, um, who, who's like a, let's say, Java, Java developer? Who's Java developer here? Okay, let's say Java. You are a Java developer and you type Java on YouTube. So what do you get? 
you actually get uh, what YouTube wants you to, uh, you, you to see, right? And the problem is that it's, it, it's usually showing you the latest Java things, the latest trendy, hypey things about Java. But I strongly believe that there's so much amazing videos that are not so fresh. This is a classic. They're the best videos. And you will never find them on, you, on YouTube. And that's a problem. Agree? There's nice classical videos, right? Maybe it's two, three years old. And this is fine. So it's kind of the information is lost. So we introduced better ranking because we take into account the amount of likes, dislikes, the uh, sentiment analysis. We even uh, analyze the comments, how people like the video. Not bad, right? And I believe that we build also a better UX and search. And we are not a UX designer, so we are just two developers. My colleague Andrew is not here. But we build a UX based on the community feedback again. So community started sending us wireframes, the better design, and we were basically implemented these ideas based on, on a community contribution. Again, quite cool, right? So if you believe that design of YouTube can be improved, you can go to DevTube and introduce your ideas there. It's open source. So uh, quite good. <laughs> but for some reason, it has become very popular because now we have more than one million of views and it's, the number is growing like crazy. So we're kind of becoming the primary hub of developers' video now. So the story is how it all started. Uh, who's speaking some Russian? Who can read some Russian? Okay. When I hear Serbian, I can make some connections. But this is a historical moment. This is the chat we had in Slack. So it's March, this year's March. I wrote, покупаю домен DevTube, 400 евро. Есть идея. Хочу собрать топовые мувики на одном сайте. And my colleague said, yes, it might work. So basically I say, hey, I have an idea. I want to buy a domain, 400 euros. I want to just collect all the videos on one website. He said, okay, that might work. And this is how it all started. So we didn't know that it will actually work extremely well. So this is a historical moment. Then I went for a trip to Spain. So I spent a month in Spain chilling, actually doing nothing, but something made me awake at nights. And this is DevTube. I wanted to launch it as soon as possible. So this is me programming in a hotel in Spain. This is Andrew, my colleague, working in some suburb as well, drinking beer. So, and we were just, I know, with, without any plans, without any specific ideas, we were just hacking like this, bam, 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 no test, no good code, you know, sha, 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 like this. And in, uh, in two months, in just two months, we built something I can't call MVP. Do you know what's MVP? What's MVP? What is that? What's MVP? It's most, like a most viable pro product, right? Right? Sounds like the most viable product, right? Uh, sorry, minimal, uh, minimal, yeah, min minimal, huh? So it's minimal viable product. And I couldn't call it minimal viable product because it was actually BVP, which is called barely viable product. <laughs> barely. It's something you don't want to show to your girlfriend, right? <laughs> because she'll make fun of you, right? It's, it, it's just a crazy, right? So it was far from perfect. No, no good code, no tests. And we wanted to develop it longer to improve, to write tests, to build nice infrastructure because you're developers, right? Developers want to build those shiny towers, clean and no mess. But something has happened. This. We, for some reason, so since the, 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 the website was public, it was already available, but no one knew about it, we started receiving requests like this, public requests. And I was like, what the heck is happening there? Unbelievably. My friend, my colleague Andrew, has shared our idea with his friend. And his friend went to Hacker News and posted it there. And he said, hi, Andrew, I submitted your great new site to Hacker News. And it's actually getting some traction. Uh, yeah, it's, it's getting some traction. So we didn't want you to publish this. Why did you do this? Well, just look at the Hacker News and see yourself. So it's the first, uh, so we stayed for three days as a top item on Hacker News, three days. That's kind of a record. So the, the online, so we were on the, on the radar among like all the developers. So we stayed there for three days. 
Then we ended up on a top three project on a product hunt, <laughs> product of the day. And, and we are still top three. So uh, if you read like a Habra Habra, some other news portals, we were also there, some local magazines, people want to conduct interviews. And I felt that we are kind of rock stars at this point, right? There are even people like Bini Shah. I don't know who is that, but this person has uh, got a po uh, posted us and we got 258 retweets and 600 likes. Can you believe that there are people famous like this in, on a Twitter? So people are using Twitter, you see? Uh, so it was like crazy. So to understand what happened next, let's look at our technology stack, just quickly. So uh, on the front end, uh, we took uh, Vue.js. Do you know Vue.js? Vue.js. So you may ask why, and I don't know <laughs> why, <laughs> because it's easy to understand. It's easy and it's easy to start with it. So basically you just take a reference project, fork it and it works. So it was just easier to start with than React on, or Angular. No other reason actually. And it gives you some cool stuff like a routing or, and state management just uh, under the hood. It's just out of the box, right? It's all you need there. And it's an amazing framework. So we took this one. We wanted to program some modern JavaScript, so we were using like a ECMAScript 6 uh, transpiled into the older JavaScript because we needed to run the app in the browser. Make sense? <clears throat> For the front end, we took Bulma. So we are not uh, UI designers. This is why we took something called Bulma, which is actually a CSS library uh, and a component library. And what makes this library amazing is that it's, it's it, because it's pure CSS, no JavaScript. So if you use like Angular, React, and no Vue or other framework like a Riot JS, you can just take this library and it, and it won't clash with your JavaScript, right? It just works out of the box. Amazing, right? So super nice, mostly client side, backend. Huh. And on the backend, we decided to take a shortcut. Nice shortcut. We found something that's called Algolia. Have you heard about Algolia? Algo people, yeah, yeah. Algolia somewhere online? Good. It's like an elastic search as a service, almost like this. And uh, we, it has very fancy UI dashboards. And uh, we decided, okay, we are two developers. We don't want to scale our Elasticsearch infrastructure. We don't have money, times we have families. So why, what if we just go with this Algolia and just use it? Because, you know, you have no idea whether the, 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 the project will be successful. Let's just, let just build it from something, right? So we took, it, we took this fantastic solution. Uh, and, you know... Uh, it, uh, it offered online, it offered a nice open source license. The website said, it's free for open source. We support open source projects. We are free. It's free for you. And then it went like this. So when we started receiving the request, Algolia basically started throttling most of them, saying, no, too much load because you're open source. That, that was the exception uh, message we received, like, uh, uh, you're, you're, you're seeing these limits because you're open source. Hey, why didn't, why didn't you tell me that before? You said free for open source. And you know what? Free is a lie. <laughs> Nothing is free, right? Nothing is free. If, if someone says to you, yeah, you're open source, good, take our money, don't believe it. Because at some point they want their money back, right? So what happened next? Algolia, so we started hitting these limits and our application were like this. So we want to grow, there's a lot of hype about the project and we are, like a, we are failing to serve our customers, right? So, I, I decided to write Algolia an email. It was like this. Algolia, we're facing extremely high load. Please provide us, us with five millions of free records. Basically, five millions of concurrent something. And I said, please, please help me, help me, help. And, and then they went. We won't be able to give you five million operations for free. Uh, 
uh, 300k operations you have is already more than what we usually give for open source. I'll bump it to 400k so we can enjoy your Hacker News ride, but I won't be able to do much more, unfortunately. What I can do, though, is to hook you up with our sales team, if you'd like. I'm a developer. I don't like talking to sales. I'm open source contributor. I'm afraid of these people. So, and when we looked at Algolia's website, we saw the pricing. Basically, in order to survive our load, we needed around 7,000 euros per month. I don't have this money, my colleague either, so we were like, a, oh my God, we have to move away from Algolia. But if I say, no, goodbye, they will just shut us down. <laughs> So you're like, oh, shit, what should I do? Right? I'm sitting like, a, I'm not crying to my friend, Andrew, Andrew, what should we do? And he was like, let's have a trick. So at this point, it was clear for us that we want to move away from Algolia, right? But if we say it openly, they would just cut us and we don't need you, right? So what I wrote, thanks, please send us the quote. Of course. So basically, uh, uh, I wanted to show them that we are their prospective customer, right? Right, so, so they treat us well. Makes sense? Some marketing, right? And you know what's funny? You know what's super funny? No reply up to now. <laughs> Seriously, no one has replied at all. So like, uh, no sales, no quote, no information. And we ended up <clears throat> with something that's called vendor lock-in, right? Very famous thing, vendor lock-in. So we had all our data in Algolia. And what's funny, our Vue.js UI was using uh, widget library provided by Algolia <laughs> to build nice UI that connects with Algolia. We're all Algolia shop. All Algolia shop, only Algolia. So. Again, the project is growing, what should we do? Vendor lock-in, the throttling all the stuff, customers are unhappy developers. And you know what it's been an unhappy developer, right? It's the one who's like a blaming, complaining, and you better stay away from these people, right? So you better make developers happy. So we decided to implement some, some optimizations. The first idea that struck our mind was debouncing. Do you know what's de debouncing, people, debouncing? What is de debouncing? What is debouncing? It's a very simple idea. The problem with Algolia was that for every keystroke, it was issuing an HTTP request on the server, right? Every keystroke led to HTTP request. So we decided that, that we will bring this uh, solution to the light. Basically, the, the bouncing is a technique that serves as a buffer. So it collects the keystrokes, let's say, for a for a half a second time span, and then sends the request. Makes sense? It's called debouncing. So we, we took an open source library, added it, and it actually, so the load dropped a bit, just a bit to save our time, right? So the debouncing, that was the solution one. Solution number two, LRU caching. But LRU caching means that we have to introduce a backend. We don't have backend. There was just UI call, talking to Algolia. So we decide, what if we really Im introduce a very simple server-side layer, which will cache the responses that we get from Algolia? Make sense? Ab makes absolute sense. So what we did, we actually, on our client side, we started intercepting all the requests that are coming from Algolia, and we started sending them to our backend that was just serving as a proxy. Very simple solution, like a dirty hack, right? But quite smart, I would say, right? So we decided, okay, we'll intercept request and we will mimic the Algolia API, which was nasty to mimic. It's like a super crappy API, but we have to kind of re-implement re re this adapter, right? The wrap around, make sense? So we were intercepting the request and we're building our own backend. But again, we are two developers working full-time in other companies. Who will implement this backend and maintain the servers? Who? Well, of course, we wanted to go serverless. So this is why uh, we decided to take ExpressJS. So if you are Node.js developer, you should know that ExpressJS is like a, a web server that runs on a Node. And uh, we decided to go for, uh, with the Google Cloud Functions. And the funny thing is that it was beta. 
It was beta. Google Cloud Functions was, was in, in beta at this point. And you know what? They just uh, they went general uh, to the GA like a month ago. And when it was in beta, it was more stable than now. Seriously. So it was better then when it was in beta, right? So that's kind of funny. Uh, but we realized that this, it's, it's a cool stuff because you don't have to care about servers. You just deploy your code there, it, and it runs. So the question is, why not Amazon Web Services, which is kind of de facto now, right? Amazon Lambdas and all the things. So very simple reason. Who, have, who, who has some Amazon experience? Do we like this access right configuration thing, right? To deploy this kind of Lambda function, you have to configure that much of like a stuff, right? So. Sorry, Amazon, we found Google Cloud functions much simpler than Amazon. And since we don't have a PhD in computer science, we don't want to learn Amazon, seriously. So uh, let's, uh, l let's give Amazon to those who have PhD, right? So no magic, everything is simple there. And by the way, Google Cloud functions also natively support Express API, right? There's no need to configure some, some uh, API gateways magic. So it's like you, you have... JavaScript web application, you just deploy it to Google Cloud Function, and it works like this. So, <clears throat> good. So we saved some time. We had this caching. Good. The, the, the bouncer. But what about long-term solution? How can we replace Algola in the long term? What's the solution? Any ideas? What's the fact the solution on the market for this full text search? Elastic? Elastic, of course, elastic, you need elastic. What are the alternatives? Of course, elastic again. Everything is elastic, right? So, and the problem is that if you do a self-hosted elastic, what do you need? You need a server, which you have to maintain. If you do uh, elastic as a service, you pay for a, for a service anyway, and which is quite expensive because elastics, elastic is a Java, right? GVM stuff. It's all your resources, like a gas, right? So we decided to make some investigation, and we found out that there are two open source libraries. One's called Lunar.js, another's called Loki.js. So these are two libraries written in JavaScript that you need to implement very lightweight full text search. So, and it's funny because we, we took these libraries, we created an index from all our videos. So at that point, we have 56,000 of videos there. And we ended up with, eight and, uh, with, with 1.8 gigabytes of RAM altogether. And then we was like, hmm, 1.8 gigabytes only. Let's look at the Google Cloud functions. The maximum amount of a Google Cloud function RAM is two gigabytes. The math is interesting, one and 1.8. Two, 1.82. It's interesting. So you know what we did? We decided to take all the data, all the data with the code, and put it in the cloud function. We basically run the data together with the code serverlessly, like this. So basically, it's a serverless in memory. Cheap full text search, super cheap. So the code is there, it's like open source, you can go and just take it. And it's super cheap and it's, it's like it scales infinitely, right? So you can spin up many of these cloud functions, right? No limits, like this. So you don't have to do capacity planning at all. So it was super nice solution. So you have to understand your data. Maybe it even fits your memory, right? Like this, very cool. So basically, data and code is deployed as a single Lambda function. <laughs> Mind-blowing, really. I still like this solution because it's mine. <laughs> so, OK. Here, like, no servers, right? So on the client side, and, and no servers? Well, not really. Because we have Nginx, load balancer. Uh, again, uh, we could go for a Google Cloud load balancer, but this was uh, solely like an economically viable decision because it's just cheaper than paying for Google's load, load balancer. And you know what's funny? It runs, of, it runs on micro I instance, micro instance, with less memory than a Raspberry Pi. 
with one CPU, and it, it handles all traffic. All traffic, and it's like a chilling. It's not really overloaded. Small micro instance. And Google, if you open Google dashboard, they are saying, oh my god, your load balancer is overly utilized. Please buy more hardware. That's what Google actually <laughs> suggests you're doing when you open their dashboard. But we don't need it, right? We, we actually can handle all the web traffic with, uh, with micro instance. Small engines, right? That's it. Uh, problems. Cold starts. So the problem is, with, do you know this cold start issue with, with lambdas, right? The cold start is an issue, and there is no good solution to this, actually. And, you know, and we were receiving many complaints. A, when you look for something, or when you search for something on DevTube, you kind of, it, it's like a, you are waiting for five or 10 seconds, right? Sometimes it just, it just holds and stuck. So you know what the, the solution was? We just added the progress bar. <laughs> Seriously, and wrote a message. Sorry, folks, uh, Google Cloud Functions are to blame. They are slow. And people like it. <laughs> developers, you know, it's a website for developers. People understood us immediately. So, <laughs> and they are not issuing any, like, a, they are not sub submitting issues anymore. So, problem solved. Of course, we have CDNs, but mostly just progress bar works like this, right? Downtime, <laughs> seriously, downtimes. So Google Cloud Function does not offer zero downtime deployment, so we had to implement it ourselves. Do you know it's blue-green deployment, right? So basically, we have two versions of the application running. You, you deploy a new version, uh, you, check, you pull it, are you alive, are you healthy, are you healthy? Yes, you're healthy, and then you switch the traffic. So we had to implement it ourselves. I know, half a day of work, not a big deal. Testing. Oh, we are guilty here. Testing. It's a startup, right? Who is doing testing as a startup, right? We do just a bit. So uh, again, we don't have this luxury of time to write unit tests for all the functionality. So we actually decide case by case whether it's viable. So uh, for example, we write unit tests when it's hard to test something manually, when it's annoying for us, or it's just expensive. Like say, we, we rate the videos, right? And we don't want to, to, to test this rating every time we change the code, right? So we sometimes write the unit test, but not all the time. And uh, we also automatically test things that are critical to our software. Let's say uh, things that, that can lead to a data corruption, right? Because we merge data from a, dev to, from a YouTube, from GitHub together. We don't want to miss the data. This is why we test it. But generally, it's mostly about manual testing, and which works extremely well for our case. And we don't even have a test environment. So we test on production. So basically, new features ready, you deploy to production. And why, why it works? Because we focus on reducing time to detect and time to recover. Do you know what is that? So if you can recover your, your, if you can roll back within a few seconds, maybe you can actually a bit sacrifice your unit test. Make sense? So if we discover the issue quickly and can roll back in a few seconds, this is the way to go, for us at least. I would like to write the unit test for everything, but I just can't do this. So, how much does it all cost? Well, how much do you think it all costs us? Sorry? 70? Okay, any other guesses? 70 bucks. Sorry? 1,000. Okay, 70,000, okay. <laughs> Sorry? 400? Okay, surprise! Our burn rate is 20 bucks a month. 20 bucks a month, right? So there is no excuse for not running your startup because you don't need investment sometimes, right? I mean, 20 bucks a month, just save on coffee. And what's cool, when you create your, your project on Google Cloud, you have 300 bucks by initially. So free. Again, free is a lie, right? But anyway, so here it's free. So the major issue is our uh, uh, dev time. So basically, we, our time is the most expensive here. Makes sense to developers, so that's the bottleneck. So we, we try to optimize our time because I don't want to explain my wife what is a unit test, right? So, and why I write it at night. So uh, this is why the major cost is our time. 
and we don't want to hire developers, build a corporation out of it. So this is why we created a leaders board on the DevTube, which is basically calculates the number of contributions people make, and they give them the karma points. And for a karma, you can exchange karma points for featuring your video on front page and so many cool stuff, right? So we decided to incentivize people like this, right? If you fix the data, Great, you, you, you get karma point. You contribute video, you get karma point. Makes sense, this is why, we, this is why we, we can't maintain everything ourselves. So this is why it works extremely well. So join in, that's cool stuff. Anything else? Well, talking about profits. So people ask me, Edward, how much, how much do you make on this? Or when you start making millions? I don't care, because we build this project for us, right? To simplify video discovery, I watch videos, so I build for myself, and it helps me and people around. So it's not going to be a commercial project. We are not going to make it profitable. And the funny thing is that we are receiving many, many, many inquiries from companies who want to give us money. Hey, just show ads to developers. And you know what? They don't understand that if we will show ads to us developers, everyone has ad blocker. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone, so it doesn't work. It's hard to make a profitable business in the development community, seriously, because everyone has an ad blocker. <laughs> so we decide, okay, let's keep profits, I don't know, for, for future maybe. Secondly, who will pay for the infrastructure? If you are open source, uh, there are so many companies willing to uh, cover your expenses. Infrastructure expenses, uh, even your development time. So if you are visible, you just, I know, write a tweet, or write on LinkedIn, Facebook, or blog, ask for money. There are companies who are ready to cover that amount, right? Hundreds, thousands, this is not a money for a large company, right? You can always ask for money. At this point, we can cover expenses ourselves. So, and of course, logo. Logo. Does it look similar? To YouTube? Of course no! Thank you! <laughs> please, if I will be invited to the court, please come with me. <laughs> there are no similarities. So uh, we did that intentionally because if you want to, to, to have a good PR, I mean to, to get some attention, you have to be aggressive in terms of marketing. Do you agree? You have to be visible, right? You have to be distinguished right from the crowd. Otherwise, you are just another project. So I intentionally build a logo like this. But I went to the lawyer, and the lawyer told me, Edward, it's not like a YouTube because the colors are different, the name is different, and the font is actually open source. No problem at all. Like this. So, my friends, I think that we run out of time, right? And, uh, well, that, that was a short story. Uh, join in. Please contribute. It's free. It's open source. And uh, enjoy watching DevTube, and thank you, thank you for having me here. Thank you.